every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, this Sunday before Easter, you know, uh, this time of year especially, we, we begin to filter and think around the cross and around the blood and around the yeah. resurrection of Christ. And I don't know why it, it, it seems natural to... Uh, to deal with maybe some, a little bit uh, deeper or unusual type of things around Easter time for some reason because of, of the, the mindset that we have about thinking of Christ on the cross and the blood that was shed for us and the resurrection and the tomb and the angels and everything surrounding the great, um, the great salvation that God has given us. And I remember a couple of weeks ago, if, if I'm not mistaken, maybe last week even, I mentioned something just in passing about, um, about God's plan of salvation and, and the fact that, uh, that, that Jesus was not a, an independent contractor that was brought onto the scene because everything else had failed. And I know a lot of times it's easy to think that way as humans. We, we, we think, okay, God is a wonderful administrator, and so God making adjustments to the fact that humanity could not succeed and keeping the commandments that he had given, and they were obviously failing miserably at being able to keep the commandments that God gave. And of course, God's commands carried with them penalties, and the penalties were you, you disobey, then you die, you know, and that was the command, and that was the penalty. And, and we have the tendency to think because God made the commands, and he made the laws, and he gave them to his people, and then his people couldn't do anything with them, that God devised another strategy by allowing the blood of animals to be sacrificed so that it could cover the sins of the guilty. That the innocent blood of an innocent animal could wash away, so to speak, the sin of the guilty. And we, ha we, we tend to think that that was a revision that God made because it became obvious that we were not going to be able to carry through on the original 10. However, if you feel that way, uh, you would be wrong about that. And then in the ultimate conclusion of things that somehow it became completely obvious to God that the blood of animals and bulls and sacrifices and so forth were not going to be sufficient for the sins of mankind and that man had to continually each year bring back the blood of bulls and goats and turtle doves and pigeons and sacrifices, lamb. And so he needed to do something more permanent. So God, in his great majesty of administrative ability, devised this plan for Jesus, his son, to come to this earth and to be the ultimate sacrifice. And that his blood, as the innocent, perfect lamb of God, would not only cover the sins of mankind, which the blood of bulls and goats had been trying to do for the centuries, but that the blood, the precious, uh, what Peter calls the precious blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus could wash away all of our sins. And our thoughts go to, to thinking that God made a wonderful uh, uh, correction in course by ultimately sending Jesus to die on this earth to die for our sins on a cruel cross to shed his blood and that his blood can wash us and make us clean. However, this is one of those things that humanity rationalizes that is just so totally not right. It, it, it is really unbelievably not right. And I'd like to share with you today uh, what God has done and what he did and what the plan was from the beginning because it's very clearly seen and it is a wonderful truth of God and a tremendously magnificent theology for you to be able to see that from the foundations of the earth, even before the earth was formed, God's plan was to send Christ to die for our sin. 
and that everything that he did before that, all of the laws, all of the sacrifices, all of the ceremonies, all of the cleansings, all of the blood for the innocent shed for the guilty, all of that was simply a preparation so that humanity could understand what Christ did on the cross and to prepare the way for what Jesus would ultimately do for mankind. We missed it as men. We missed it because uh, we rarely see spiritual things like this. As a matter of fact, this is why Jesus had to say all the time, uh, let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says. This is his way of saying, look, you guys are going to have to look deeper than just this little surface level stuff that you're happening to view life on. You're going to have to dig in with me a little bit, and, and you can see the, the, the wonderful, uh, as a matter of fact, he calls it in Psalm 25, the secret of God. It's un unusual. Would you like to know the secret of God? It says, the secret of God is with them who reverence him, who fear him, reverentially fear. Uh, and, and he will show them his covenant. In other words, if you want to know the secret of God, then understand the covenant that God has made with all of us. And, and, and I have it on the screen for you. It's called the blood covenant, the covenant of blood. And, and I wrote in your outline uh, just a little introduction, and I'm going to just read it because uh, I, uh, I think it says what we need to say to get cranking into what we're doing today. So if you have the outline I gave you and, and wrote for you, uh, you can look at that. One of the most familiar quotes of the Bible is the passage that we typically use in the ceremony of the Lord's Supper. This Friday night, we'll use this, word, this verse. We use it every Lord's Supper ceremony. It's one of the verses that we use. And it's, this one happens to be out of Luke 22, but Matthew has it, Mark has it, Luke has it, and John even has a little bit different variety of it, but it, it basically says the same thing. And it says, and, and the quote is, this cup, this is Jesus speaking when he raises the cup at the, at the Passover, uh, at last Passover meal, and he raises the cup, and, he, and he's sharing communion with his disciples, and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And then we usually follow that with another verse from Hebrews 9.22 that says, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. These verses, like all others concerning the cleansing of sin, reflect the truth of a majestic theology. There's a scarlet thread that runs throughout the entire Word of God that reflects God's masterful plan of salvation. The hymn writer, Robert Lowry, penned it best with his simple question, what can wash away my sin? And of course, God's answer is nothing but the blood of Jesus. <laughs> the blood of Jesus. So the truth of the blood covenant is one of the greatest truths that we can learn. So let's get started at it. Let's look at the importance of the blood. Well, let me, finish. Let me read these verses to you uh, first. Can you see that good enough? Somehow that thing has uh, transposed itself. Now, when he had finished, this is, uh, first, this, is, this is 1 Samuel 18. I don't know. Anyway, can you read that? Okay, I can read it to you. This is 1 Samuel 18, the beginning of the blood. There it goes, the beginning of the blood covenant. Now, when, when he had finished speaking to Saul... Jonathan, Saul, son, a couple of, couple of characters you'll need to know uh, and throughout this whole wonderful narrative of, of what's about to happen. This is 1 Samuel 18. Uh, they, king David, of course, is not king yet. He's, he's still servant David, and he's serving in the palace of Saul, who is the king of Israel. Saul has four sons. The oldest son is Jonathan. He is the heir to the throne, so to speak, and and, uh, and, and David and Jonathan strike up a real friendship, a real, a real connection with each other. And, and, uh, and so Jonathan has a son, and you'll meet him in a few minutes, and his name is Mephibosheth. And I know that's a funny kind of a name, but, but I, I didn't name him, but that's his name, Mephibosheth. And, uh, and so David has a relationship with Jonathan, even though David is not king yet, and they become friends. They're like, uh, like teenage friends. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, Jonathan, that is, the life of Jonathan was knit to the life of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. 
So Saul took him that day, took David, and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Everybody say, blood covenant. All right, let's look at the importance of the blood covenant just for a second. I'm just going to kind of amble through this for a minute. But the blood covenant is important. Why is the blood covenant important? Well, first of all, because it's the subject of the Bible. We have a Bible that is divided into two divisions, right? We have an Old Testament and a New Testament. The word testament is diathake in the Greek, and diathake means a covenant or a will or a contract. The word in Hebrew is the word barith, which means which adds a connotation to it of cutting. Uh, so, in other words, we have an old blood covenant, and we have a new blood covenant, and 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 so all of the Bible is about the blood, and it's about the covenant that God makes with us that is based on that is based on blood. Uh, if you cut the Bible anywhere, the Bible bleeds because it's all concerning the blood that was shed for us and the blood that will cover our sins. Secondly, it, it's the source of blessing. All of the covenant promises of God are blood covenant promises. You know, God made covenants with men on this earth, and you've read about them in the Bible. God made a covenant with Noah. God made a covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant with Moses. God made a covenant with Noah. God made a covenant with David. God had a covenant with his church and with a new covenant with Israel and, 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 and with, with all of the sinners who are repentant on this earth. God has a covenant. And all of these covenants and all these promises that God makes with us are blood covenant promises. Here's what uh, Paul says to us in 2 Corinthians 1. For all of the promises of God in him... And who is him? Everybody say his name. Jesus. For all of the promises of God in Jesus are yes, and in Jesus are amen to the glory of God, uh, for the glory of God through us. So God says all of the promises that I make to mankind, in, even including the fact that you've been promised salvation in heaven when you die, these promises are yes and let it be, amen, in Christ, because they're all blood covenant promises. And, and then this is the passage I quoted a few minutes ago from Psalm 25. The secret of the Lord is with those who reverence him, and he will show them his covenant. It just shows you that if you want to know the secret of God and you want to be blessed of God, let God show you the secret of his covenant. So the importance of the, of the covenant is that it's the subject of the Bible. It's the source of blessing. You might want to write another little thing in your outline. I didn't write it in there, but you could say uh, it's the secret of blessing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's the secret of blessing. It's the secret of boldness in life is what it is. Because bold are those who understand that our relationship with God is a relationship that is, blessed, that is based on a covenant and not based on fickled feelings. So I don't have to be fearful that somehow uh, I'm going to lose out or that God's going to change his mind. And so God gives me a great source of boldness through the blood covenant. All right, secondly, the indications of the blood covenant. What happens when a blood covenant is cut between two people? How many of you watched some old westerns? You watched uh, the Lone Ranger. Maybe I'm dating somebody. Lone Ranger, uh, Roy Rogers, uh, Big Valley, uh, Bonanza. Um, you know, any of those, any of those, especially those old westerns. Now, I don't know if it's become like politically incorrect to have this kind of thing on them now, but back then, you know, there was this real big deal made, and you might remember, especially if you're older, uh, where you had the uh, the Indian nation or whoever it might be, whichever tribe it might be, and you had some cowboys, and these cowboys and these Indians had to have relations with each other because they used the same land and they were after some of the same things and blah blah. Anyway, and and you would notice on the movie sometimes that they would uh, go through a ceremony together and this ceremony would create a bond between them so that they were no longer enemies, but they were friends. Well, what was that bond? Well, they became blood brothers, right? You remember this phrase? Well, what was a blood brother? Well, a blood brother went through about, there were three things that happened when you made a blood covenant with someone. One is, the first thing that happened is there was a cut made, right? And the cut was either made in the hand, possibly on the wrist, and then the, of, each, of each participant, and then those participants would come together. They would put their hands together like this. 
so that the blood of one would mingle with the blood of, a, of the other, or they would put their wrists together so that their, the, the blood would mingle with each other. And then they would raise the hands like this, and they would make some kind of vow about, you know, we will be friends forever, we will, you know, and, and then they would, give the, they would give the conditions of the blood brother covenant, and they became blood brothers. So the first thing that happens in a blood covenant is that there is a sharing of personhood. When you share in a blood covenant, the first thing that happens is that, that uh, your, blood, your blood flows into the veins of another and their blood flows into your veins. So your life flows into their life and their life flows into your life and a new relationship is created that is reflected by a new attitude. And here's the new attitude of the new relationship. It's called loving kindness. Now, loving kindness is a beautifully poetic word, and it sounds very lovely. But the word loving kindness is a covenant word. What is loving kindness? What's the difference between kindness and loving kindness? Well, kindness would be uh, if you ask your mom for a biscuit... And before she gave you the biscuit, without you asking, she would just slap a little butter on there. That would be kindness. But if you asked your mom for a biscuit and you didn't ask for anything else, and mom slapped some butter and some jelly on there and gave it to you, that would be loving kindness. It is. <laughs> I see some of you already hungry about that. Maybe I should have used some other example. But anyway, this is the new attitude of the new relationship. And you know what this new relationship is called? And it's going to surprise you because it's such a casual word for us now. Uh, the new relationship is called friend. Friend is a much deeper word and a much deeper uh, meaning than we so casually give it nowadays. We talk to people. Yeah, we talk to people we don't even know. And we say, well, friend, you know, or uh, when we used to write letters, I know we don't do that anymore, uh, you, and you probably don't do it when you text, but when we used to write letters, we would write a letter sometimes to somebody that we didn't even know, and we would start it like, dear friend. Well, friend is a much deeper meaning and a much deeper relationship than we so casually give it, because the Bible teaches us that we become friends with those whom we have a covenant relationship with. Give an example. In the Old Testament, you have heard of Abraham, Right? You remember God made a covenant with Abraham. And what does the Bible say about this covenant God made with Abraham? It says, and Abraham believed God, and then he was called the friend of God. You remember reading a verse in the Bible that says, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And of course, we know that's talking about Jesus and the fact that closer than any physical relative that we have is our Lord Jesus because we have a covenant with Jesus. But you are closer to someone that you have a covenant with than you are even to your own family. So first of all, in a blood covenant, there's a sharing of personhood. Here's the second. There is a sharing of possessions. When a blood covenant was made, usually one or both of the participants would, would, if they had a robe or if they had a jacket or if they had some type of clothing or a belt or a sash of some kind, they would take it off and give it to the other person, symbolizing that all that I have is yours. Everything that I have is yours and it is at your disposal. And if you need it, anytime you need it, you can have it and you can have anything I have because all that I have you have. So there's a sharing of personhood, there's a sharing of possessions, and then lastly, there's a sharing of protection and power. Usually, if, uh, in, in, the, in the ceremony, a weapon is given. Now, it might be a knife, it might be a bow, it could be a spear, it could be a sword. I mean, it could be anything that the participants have, and they would usually share that with each other. And what that meant is, whenever there is a fight, or whenever there is a battle, or whenever you are in trouble, or you need it, whenever you need my power and my protection symbolized by this knife or this bow or this, or this uh, spear or this sword, uh, it is yours. I am there. Everything that I have, all of the weapons, all of the power that I have at my disposal is yours anytime you need it because we are blood brothers. 
And not only did it extend to the person that was making the covenant, it also extended to, all, to, to the people, any of the people that that person loved. In other words, uh, I'm going to love you like I love my own family, like I love my own self. I'm going to love those that you love like I love myself and like I love my own family. So not only will I protect you, not only will I come to your aid, not only can you count on me, but anybody you love can also count on me. So the importance of the blood covenant, the Bible's all about it. It's the source of blessing in our life. It's the secret to boldness for all of us. And, 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 and the weapons that God gives us are blood covenant weapons. Now, let's look at this illustration of the blood covenant. The illustration of the blood covenant is a wonderful narrative, a great story all, uh, that covers the book of 1 Samuel chapter 18 through 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now, I'm going to tell you the story, all right? Can I make it? I'm going to just thumbnail it for you, all right? How, how many of you have ever heard me thumbnail anything? <laughs> it's pretty thumbed, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the illustration, beautiful illustration now of the blood covenant and, and, and what it's all about. And remember, we're talking about that scarlet thread that runs all the way through the Bible, all the promises of God, all the covenants of God, all the blessings of God, all of that, all of those are blood covenant blessings and blood covenant promises. There are promises that are true and have been made by God to us. And so David and Jonathan are beautiful illustrations of the blood covenant. Let me just show you a couple of the things that we've already talked about just quickly so you can see how this thing starts. We've read these first three or four verses. Verse 1 of 1 Samuel 18, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the life of Jonathan was knit to the life of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So we have a sharing of personhood. The life of David and the life of Jonathan were put together. The life that flowed in Jonathan's veins now flow in David's veins, and David's veins flow in Jonathan's veins, and now they are in a relationship that is, uh, uh, that is controlled by a new attitude of loving kindness, and they have become, in a new relationship, friends. Verse 4, and Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David. So there is the sharing of possessions. Jonathan was saying to David, David, all that I have is yours. And if you need it, whatever you need at any time, it is at your disposal, and you may have it or use it any time you like. And then in verse 4 at the end, and Jonathan took off the robe and was on, that was on him and gave it to David. Notice, with his armor... Even to his sword and his bow and his belt, there is the sharing of protection and power. So Jonathan is saying to David, David, all that I have is yours. Everything that I own belongs to you. My person, my possessions, my protection, my power, it all belongs to you. I love you as I love my own life. We are inseparably linked together. We are now in blood covenant. And so now Jonathan is actually closer to David than he is to his own father Saul. And it's a good thing because Saul has become infected with what I would call a, a demon of envy. The green-eyed monster of jealousy has jumped up and grabbed Saul because Saul has heard the women singing around the kingdom. For Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. In other words, they, David slay, slew Goliath and has become the hero of all of the Nice women around the kingdom and all the families around the kingdom. And Saul is hearing what they say on the streets and hearing what, they, uh, what they're talking about and how wonderful David is and how marvelous David is and how Saul is becoming insane and he's becoming, he's becoming sick uh, with rage and he's uh, basically falling into mental illness is what's going on to him. Well, he gathers all of his soldiers together and all of his servants and all of his household, including Jonathan, and here's what he says to them. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all of his servants that they should kill David. So now the whole thrust of the kingdom of Israel has been boiled down to one thing. Kill David. The whole thrust of the family of Saul has boiled down to one thing. Kill David. But notice, Jonathan, but Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. Remember, Jonathan has a covenant with David. He's actually closer to David than he is to his own family. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And so David now has to begin to run for his life. Over the Judean hills, Saul and the armies of Israel pursue David day and night. 
David is like a, is, is hunted like a wild animal and Saul is after him. And Saul is, is, is trying everything in his power to kill David. Many opportunities come for David to actually kill Saul. And I know that many of you that have read the story know that there were many times David could have taken Saul's life, but because David respected the anointing of God and the fact that God had called Saul to be king of Israel and that God was not through with Saul yet, David restrained himself from actually taking the life of Saul. But Saul was constantly pursuing David until finally one day, both Saul and Jonathan, and actually Jonathan's two brothers, Saul had actually four sons, three of them and Saul were all killed on the same day in the same battle by those hated Philistines. And now the throne was vacated. David had one son that was made to be, and, and I don't want to get too much into history because it might get a little boring to you, but, but Israel at this time was divided into two sections. There was the north that was called Israel and the south that was called Judah. David was immediately anointed king of Judah. Saul's son, uh, whose name was Ishbosheth, <laughs> try to say that, Ishbosheth, um, was made king of the northern part, Israel, and he was king for two years until he was finally assassinated by his own men. But, but anyway, it's another story. Once that happens, once that happens, then David is made king over the entire nation of Israel. And once David is made king over the entire nation of Israel, things at Saul's house change. Because Jonathan has actually a son. And he's a little boy at this time. As a matter of fact, let me just show you the verse. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel about the fact that they were killed on the same battlefield on the same day. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. So Jonathan has a little son, and when, and when jo both, both Saul and Jonathan were killed on the same day, of course, you know what happens in the kingdom, right? Have you ever heard the word blood purge? A blood purge is when the ruling family loses their lineage, and someone else comes to take the lineage, and so they actually kill everybody that is associated with the former royal family. I know this sounds gruesome and so forth, but it's just the fact of what happens. And so uh, expecting a blood purge as soon as the nurse that has little Mephibosheth out there in the backwoods of nowhere hears that Saul and Jonathan have both been killed in battle on the same day, the nurse assumes, oh no, the blood purge is going to begin. I've got to get little Mephibosheth, because Mephibosheth now is the crown prince. I mean, he is, he is the lineage of royalty that's still left behind. And she says, I've got to get the little crown prince, and we've got to get out of here, because somebody's going to soon be coming, and they're going to they're gonna take him, and they're going to kill him, because they don't want anybody left that is of the lineage of Saul, who has an heir, who has a rightful heir to the throne. And so in her haste, as she begins to pick him up and, and, and get all of his stuff together, you know, his pacifiers and his bottles and his rattles and everything, and, and she gets him and she, and as she's beginning to run with him, she trips a little, stumbles a little, and he falls out of her arms. And I don't know if she fell on top of him or what, but it, his legs got all broken up and, 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 and it never got reset. And so he grew up and all of his life, his legs have, are now deformed, crippled by the fall. And, 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 uh, and, and he grows up this way, and, and he lives the rest of his life like that. And, and so she takes little Mephibosheth, who now has been crippled by the fall, out to the backside of nowhere to a place called Lodibar. Lodibar is about as, uh, is about as, uh, as lackluster as the name sounds that it is. The name Lodibar, by the way, means place of no pasture. And so you can imagine now you have the little crown prince hiding out on the backside of nowhere in a place of no pasture, hating David, fearing David, trembling at the thought of David, 
being taught that one day David might come and it's going to be horrible if David comes breathing dust, eating dirt, drinking out of a dirty cup, living in a filthy, dirty, dusty hideaway, a crown prince in exile. Now what happens next is David comes on the scene. And when David comes on the scene, uh, things begin to change for Mephibosheth. Now David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul? And you can imagine what the people thought when he said that phrase. You can imagine the people's eyes looking and cutting to each other and said, mm, I, knew, I wondered when it was going to begin. I knew, I knew it wasn't going to be long until he would be after the house of Saul. And with knowing looks and glances, they would begin to look at each other and say, ooh, I know what's going to happen now. The blood purge is going to begin. But David wasn't finished. Notice what David said. David said, is there anyone, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Not because of him, but because of Jonathan. And there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to, uh, called, uh, him to King David, uh, the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, at your service. Then the king said, is there still not Someone is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there's still a son of Jonathan who's lame in his feet. So the king said, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed he is in the house of Machir, the son of Emil. You made it in the Bible, Lawrence. Y'all don't know Lawrence's name is Emil. And the son of Emil in Lodibar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Emil in Lodibar. I can imagine that, can't you? Can't you imagine that, Lo that here's a little Mephibosheth sitting in the, in, in the house in, in Lodibar on the backside of nowhere, dusty, nasty, hot, no pasture. Every word that he, begins, that he hears from the people around him says, David's after him, the king is going to get him. Uh, there'll come a day when uh, he'll see some soldiers and he'll need to run and hide and he'll treat how to, and, and all of a sudden little, 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 little Mephibosheth lifts his head up over a, a, a dusty windowsill and he looks in the distance and he sees a bunch of king soldiers and army and horsemen coming down, coming toward his little shack. And don't, can you imagine the fear that begins to go through his heart as he thinks what's going to happen to me? They're coming to get me. And it's going to be horrible. And my nurse told me what was going to happen to me. And why does it have to happen to me? I'm not going to do anything. They can let me go. I mean, all of these emotions. And so as the army approaches, it's too late for Mephibosheth to run. It's too late for him to hide. And so there he is caught on the backside of nowhere trying to, trying to escape David and try to hide from David. But it's too late. So the king's men get him. And they bring him to Mephibosheth. They bring him to David. Notice verse 6. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. I'm sure as he fell, he was thinking, I hope they will be merciful. I pray this will be quick. And he's trembling as he thinks, here comes the axe. And then David says, Mephibosheth? And he answered, here's your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I'll surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and he said, look at what he said. Mephibosheth said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a, such a dead dog as I? And David basically says to him, look, I'm not doing this for your sake. I'm doing this because I'm in a covenant relationship with your father, and I'm honor-bound to make this offer to you. Now Mephibosheth has a decision he has to make. Mephibosheth, do you want to keep the covenant? The covenant wasn't with you, so you have a choice. Do you want to abide by the covenant that I had with your father, Jonathan? 
And Mephibosheth undoubtedly says, uh huh. <laughs> and what a transformation happens when Mephibosheth enters the covenant. And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I've given your master's son all that belongs to Saul and to all his house. Imagine that, a king's ransom. <laughs> you, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work, for, work the land for him. Because he can't work the land. He's got little, little deformed legs and can't take care of himself. So, Ziba, you and your sons are going to have to take care of all of his land for him. And you shall bring in the harvest and your master's son, that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Quite productive family, wouldn't you say? <laughs> A lot of action going on. Never mind. Anyway, then, then Ziba said to the king, whew, then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servants, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both of his feet. So you talk about a transformation that takes place. Yesterday, he was eating dust and drinking dirt and Lodabar, and now he's eating at the king's table. Now he's part of the king's family. I mean, yesterday he was, he was a stranger in exile, and today he's a, he's a prince sitting sitting at, at the king's table. And I'm sure he began to think while he's sitting at the king's table. One day, he's sitting there thinking, looking at all around him, and he's remembering Lodabar and the dust and the dirt and the hot and the heat and the wind and the sand and the nastiness and the hate and the fear and the anxiety and the discomfort of Lodibar. Hating David, fearing David, running from David, uh, being taught that David was out to get him all of his life. And now he's looking around and he's finding himself at the king's table and he's looking at the golden goblets and the silver vessels. And he's looking at the bread and the nice and the wine and the food and all of the exorbitance of the king's table. And he's sitting there at breakfast and, he, and, he, and he's thinking to himself, uh, uh, man, I, I can't understand this. I, I can't explain it. I, what's happened? I, I, I don't know what to say about it. I don't know what to think about it. I, I, well... I guess I'll just enjoy it. Uh, pass some biscuits, please. <laughs> and as David passes the biscuits, put some butter and jam on it. <laughs> David passes the biscuits, put some butter and jam, passes the biscuits to Mephibosheth. In the breaking of the bread, Mephibosheth looks and sees the scars on the wrist of David. <clears throat> And says, all this is happening to me, not because of me, but because of the covenant that the king had with my dad. All of this that's happening to me is happening to me because of the blood covenant. Now, I'm sure you're ahead of me on the implications of the blood covenant. What does this imply? A marvelous story, a wonderful historical thought, some wonderful events that happened, that really happened and truly happened. These are historical events that are marked very well in, her, in historical chronicles. Everything that I just described to you happened, just like the Bible says it does. But God puts wonderful narratives like this in the Bible for a purpose. And the purpose is that it would show us something about ourselves and about God and about our relationship with God. And the fact that the blood covenant has been, has been in existence for eternity, that it's not the blood of Christ shed on the cross for the sins of the world to wash away. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That that's not just a recent event. That wasn't just a, uh-oh, I need to do something to help these guys. 
This has been God's plan from eternity. And of course, you see Mephibosheth is the perfect picture of all of us before Christ came into our life. Look, deformed as we are all deformed and twisted by sin, crippled from the fall, powerless. Mephibosheth could not go to David. He had to be brought to David. Just like you and I can't go to God, we have to be brought to God by the Holy Spirit of God dethroned a crown prince in exile. What did I have to give up in order to enter the kingdom of God? You say, well, I, what did you have to give up to enter the kingdom of God? And I'm going to say to you, basically nothing. I mean, who wouldn't trade dirt for diamonds, right? Who wouldn't trade, trade uh, hog's wheel for nectar? Who wouldn't trade the backside of Loaded Bar for the king's palace? So, Mephibosheth is, is a crown prince in exile. And he, notice what he said about it. I'm a dead dog. Not just a dog, but he said, well, what, what, would, what would make you consider a dead dog like me? He called himself a dead dog. That, I guess that's why Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it to you abundantly. Because Jesus is the only thing that takes a dead dog and brings it back to life. I'm serious. And deceived? How deceived were we? We've been taught all of our life, and the devil whispered in our ear, God doesn't love you. God's after you. God wants you. God's going God's to restrict your fun. God's going to take away your toys. God's going to stomp the class turtle. God, I mean, we're taught all of our life to run from God and hide from God and hate God and fear God and run away from God. I'm telling you, if God couldn't run faster than we could, we'd have never been saved. And we're not valuable because because. because of ourselves, we're valuable because God loves us. And why did he do this? Well, Paul in Ephesians 4 says that God showed his love for us for Christ's sake. <laughs> why did God do all of these wonderful things? Because I'm such a wonderful person and I'm so great? No, because of Christ's sake. Christ is the key to the blood covenant of our life. And so Mephibosheth's a wonderful picture of us. Of course, David, obviously, I know you've got it by now is a great picture of God and his loving kindness and his mercy. What did Mephibosheth receive when King David welcomed him into the kingdom? Well, he received the king's forgiveness. Look at verse 7. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather. So when, when, when David welcomed him in because of the covenant with Jonathan, what did Mephibosheth receive? Well, he received forgiveness from the king. For our sake, for Christ's sake, what does God do for us? God says, gives us his forgiveness. God forgives us for our life. You know, that is such an astounding thing and an amazing thing because I know people find that hard to believe. I know people find it hard to believe that that somehow I can come to the Lord and I can ask Christ to be the king of my life and to save my soul and that I can receive just that simply the forgiveness of the king. But I can, and you know why? Because of the blood covenant that God has with us, not for our sakes, but for Christ's sake. He forgives us. Through Jesus Christ, he forgives us. That that precious blood, that powerful blood. That's why there's power in the blood, right? Yeah, power, power. You remember that? So, hope. Let's see. Uh, for there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. What's the verse? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Yeah. yeah well, anyway, we could sing it. Power, power. King's forgiveness is what I'm trying to say. Secondly, the king's fellowship. Uh, not only does he restore everything to him and he shows him kindness, but look at the last line, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. So he gets the king's fellowship. He gets to sit down. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but there's just something marvelous about eating with people. Have you noticed that? It's just something special about it, isn't it? 
I mean, there's a unique fellowship when you eat together. I mean, you can, you know, you can talk with each other. You can go to a movie. You can, you know, frolic around here and there. You can do, you can have all, you can work together, you know. You can enjoy life together. So, but, but when you sit down to eat with somebody, it just is just something special about sitting down and eat. It like, it like carries fellowship just another step further, doesn't it, right? I think that's why a lot of times when we, when we become friends, some, one of the things we want to do is, hey, come over to the house and let's eat, you know? <laughs> come, on, come over, we're going to cook you something on the grill or something. It's going to be wonderful. And there's just this marvelous fellowship. And we get to enjoy not only the, the, the forgiveness of the king, but we get to enjoy fellowship with the king not for our sake, but because Jesus has a blood covenant and we have a covenant with Jesus. Look at what else he got. The king's fortune. And the king called his Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and all of his house. Now, I'll just remind you that Saul was not just a commoner in the kingdom. He was the king. That meant everything that belonged to the king Mephibosheth just inherited everything that belonged. You're talking about winning the lottery. I mean, my goodness, folks, this is an amazing thing. And it was, I mean, David could have kept everything. David was the king. He was a duly elected, duly appointed king of Israel. It was all of his stuff, the palace, the gold, the, everything was his. But because of his covenant with Jonathan, David said, Mephibosheth, I'm going to give you everything that belonged to your father Saul and everything that belonged to your father David, uh, Jonathan and all that belonged to his house. So he received the king's forgiveness. He received the king's fellowship. He received the king's fortune. And then finally, the king's family. Notice, and then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do as for Mephibosheth, said the king. He shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Not like one of the hired hands. Not like as some uh, stranger uh, that just came over and somehow we were having supper and we remember him while we're having supper, but he was one of the family. So, it all based on Mephibosheth. Would you like to keep the covenant? Now, I don't, I don't know where you might be. You know, some of you might be running from God. If I said, are you running from God? You wouldn't raise your hand. I know you wouldn't raise your hand. But if you are running from God, I'm going to just ask you, why are you running from God? <coughs> Mephibosheth ran from David all of his life. David had to finally run him down in order to bless him. If David couldn't run faster than Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth would be still sitting out at Lodabar, eating dust and dirt and drinking out of a nasty cup. So what are you running from? Hiding from God? Somebody said, man, I'm hiding from God. I'm thinking... Well, I'm thinking, where are you going to hide from God? I mean, God's everywhere. God knows everything. Where are you going to hide from God? By the way, you're not that hard to find, so I don't know what you're hiding from. Running from God. Hating God. Hating God. There are people that hate God. And I'm saying, you don't know enough about God to hate God. Why are you hating God? All God wants to do is bless you. All God is doing is looking for use that he might show you loving kindness for Christ's sake. And the question really then just becomes, do you want to keep the covenant? Do you want to ratify the covenant? And that's what life's all about. Look, I know you have some family. I know you have some friends. I know you have some neighbors. I know you have some people you go to school with, people you work with. I know you have people you run in, and, and, and many of them are running from God, hating God, uh, hiding from God. Move away because they've been taught all their life that God's out to get them. And he's going to spoil their fun and he's going to kill their life and he's going to rob their joy and he's going to take away everything from them that they like. But I'm just saying to you, according to the covenant of God and the blood covenant, all God is doing is God is looking for people that he might show loving kindness to and that he might call friends. 